Another question. What is the right Christian stand on dancing, playing cards, and drinking? Now, I don't want to get into this in long detail. But let me just say this. Dancing is in the Bible to start with. There's no question about that. David danced before the Lord. There was dancing and praising God in Psalm 150. The Old Testament, there was dancing that was exalting and praising the Lord. Now, if you were, however, to use that as a defense of modern-day dancing, you would find yourself ill-pressed to do that. <laughs> the dancing that was done in the Old Testament was done by an individual before God as the full expression of joy. I'm not even too sure that there were any particular steps. I don't think somebody did, uh, you know, when they got really blessed, they did the funky chicken or whatever the thing is, you know. <laughs> I don't think they had, a, they had a new wave of Hebrew dances swinging through the land. What it means is that they praise God by the expression of the body. They just abandoned themselves to the joy that was theirs in God. There wasn't any indication that it was ever a partner thing or there ever was anything closely or remotely related to sexual stimulation involved. But on the other hand, if you study Old Testament history, you'll find out that the pagans danced orgy dances. And the whole key to what they were doing was to stimulate the sex drive. That's what we've inherited today. Not the worshipful expression of the body as it frees itself to just glorify God and to express its joy as it spins and twirls and jumps and leaps and praises God. You know who did a dance in the New Testament? The guy in Acts that got healed. He was dancing all the way through the temple, leaping and jumping and praising God. Now that God likes. But hanging on somebody and going around a smoke-filled room... <laughs> with the lights out while somebody sings a suggestive song isn't remotely related to the Word of God. You know, we used to say when we were in Christian school, I went to a Christian school and didn't have any dances, you know, we were fairly well protected. A guy became a Christian, you know, and he said, you know, we used to go to the dance because we'd take a girl out and take her to the dance, get her all warmed up, and then we could go out and neck. He said, then when I became a Christian, I realized you don't dance, you just go right out and neck. <laughs> Yeah, it's true, right? The point is, anything, anything that in any way stimulates desire for another person physically outside marriage, outside that which honors and glorifies God in every part, is to be disregarded and turned away from totally. Totally. And believe me, the way the world sets up dances, they aren't dances to praise God. That's the only kind of dancing Israel ever did. Now, what about uh, playing cards? Well, there's nothing wrong with a card. A card isn't going to hurt you. Just a little card. The only thing I can say is this. If, if it bothers your conscience to do it, don't do it. Or if it's going to make somebody else stumble, don't do it. Or if it's going to make somebody else think less of your testimony, don't do it. But if you feel that it has not those factors, it isn't problematic, and you can do it to the glory of God. That's between your conscience and the community in which you exist and the people in which you exist. For example, if I were to go over to uh, the middle of Africa and sit down among a crowd of Africans and somebody pulled out a deck of cards and we were to sit there and play, uh, I don't know, what do you play? I don't even know how to play the thing. But let's say 21. I remember that one. Uh, <laughs> Let's say we all sat down in the middle of Africa and played 21. You think the Africans would be offended? Not on your life. They wouldn't have the faintest idea of what we were even doing. That certainly wouldn't be any great offense to God if we didn't have anything else to do in the burning sun, play a little 21. <laughs> but on the other hand, in the culture in which I live, if I were to be doing that, somebody would stumble over it, so I don't do it. Card in itself isn't evil. What about drinking? Well, the Bible says so much about that, and I've said it all in the past. Recently, a new article came out I thought was very, very interesting. Uh, it was in Christianity Today, and I thought I'd give you some thoughts from it that were very helpful. Written by Robert Stein, it says this, among other things, the wine of the Bible was not unfermented grape juice. Yes, it was different from the wine of today. What he means by that is some people would say, well, the wine Jesus drank wasn't fermented. Of course it was fermented. How could they keep it from being fermented? But it was different from today. Listen. In ancient times, wine was usually stored in large pointed jugs called amphorae, 
When wine was to be used, it was poured from the amphorae into large bowls called craters, where it was mixed with water. From the craters, cups or killicks were then filled. What is important for us to note is that before wine was ever drunk, it was mixed with water. The killicks were filled not from the amphorae, but from the craters. The ratio of water to wine varied. Homer mentions a ratio of 20 to 1, 20 parts water to one part wine. A quotation from a play by Aristophanes reads, here, drink this also, mingled three and two. Demas says, Zeus, but it's sweet and bears the three parts well. So here again is an indication of history that it was always mixed. There are mentions of everything from two to one to twenty to one. Now sometimes in history the ratio of mixing water to wine goes down to one to one, and when it does, it is not called wine, but it is called strong drink. This is important. Drinking wine unmixed, on the other hand, was looked upon as a Scythian or barbarian custom. Athanasius in his work quotes uh, Menesius of Athens, and this is what he says, "'The gods have revealed wine to mortals to be the greatest blessing for those who use it right, but for those who use it without measure, the reverse, for it gives food to them that take it and strength in mind and body. In medicine it is beneficial. It can be mixed with liquid and drugs and bring aid to the wounded. In daily life, to those who mix and drink it moderately, it gives good cheer. But if you overstep the bounds, it brings violence. Mix it half and half and you get madness, unmixed, bodily collapse. <laughs> From these incidents in history, it is evident that wine was seen in ancient times as a medicine or a solvent for medicines, and of course as a beverage. Yet as a beverage, it was always thought of as a mixed drink. Plutarch says we call a mixture wine, although the larger of the components is water. The ratio of water might vary, but only barbarians drank it unmixed, and a mixture of wine and water of equal parts was called strong drink and frowned on. The term wine, or oinos in the ancient world then, did not mean wine as we understand it today, but wine mixed with water. And in fact, when it was unmixed, they used the term akrotesteron, which meant unmixed wine. Barbarians drank that. People who wanted to play around with the edges drank one-to-one, -one, but people who had sense of propriety always drank it mixed. Even the Bible makes the distinction, and the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, drink no wine nor strong drink, and there's the differentiation when you go to the tent of the meeting. Well, there you can see people. The safest and easiest method of making water safe to drink was mixing it with wine, which acted as a purifier. 